This lecture will complete our summary of the um, model, the current model of the atom, which today is called the quantum mechanical model. And there are several scientists who contributed to that, but the key was really understanding more about the mysterious electron. So it was sometime in the early 1900s, and some of these names um, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Einstein, Bohr, de Broglie, Max Planck, Heisenberg, and Schrodinger all contribute, really contributed real important pieces to understanding um, our current model of the atom. And the key to quantum mechanics in general and the quantum mechanical model is the discovery or finding that subatomic matter like electrons, protons, neutrons, etc., behaved completely different than objects which are lar large enough, enough for us to see. And you may have heard of the wave matter duality. Um, it turns out that light, um, which is energy, not matter, and then um, also matter, like the electron, sometimes behaves as a wave and sometimes behave as a particle. And once it was proposed that the electron also has this wave-particle duality, uh, things kind of took off as far as uh, modifying our model of the atom. So let me give you one specific experiment that was done that was key. Einstein investigated something we now call the photoelectric effect. So he took uh, metal made up of um, all the same atoms, okay, and he shined light on that metal, um, expecting that when he reached the right amount of energy, um, an electron would be kicked out of the surface of that metal. What he found, though, was interesting because he found that he had to have the exact correct frequency of light or the electrons wouldn't be ejected. So if he had, let's say, a frequency that was too low and he kept shining more and more light, like gave it more and more intensity, um, it didn't matter. The electron never got ejected. So he had to start with an electron, or excuse me, start with light of a particular energy to get any electron to get kicked out. We'll talk about this more in a few slides when we get to the work that Niels Bohr did, and I'll draw um, or I'll explain how the model was modified after this. But often the final exams want you to understand what the photoelectric effect is. So I did want to go over that briefly. So what did that tell us? That told us that um, electrons are held to the atom with a very specific energy level. And that energy level cannot vary. <clears throat> so quantum mechanics in general, which opened up a whole new world to us, um, again, there's a, a duality. Um, it said that matter can behave as either a wave, which is um, a form of energy, and in some other experiments, uh, matter can e act as a particle. And... The wave behavior is important because it allows us to explain all sorts of phenomena like electricity, um, emission and absorption of light if you've ever done UV spectroscopy, and also chemical bonding. So, well, one scientist proposed that matter had a dual nature just as light does. They kind of turned to light to better understand um, behavior of the electron, and it helped quite a bit. So a quick review of light. It is a form of electromagnetic um, radiation, and the only type of light we can see, of course, is the visible light, but any type, anything in the electromagnetic radiation from radio waves, uh, whoop, radio waves would be on this end, to gamma rays um, are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. One thing to keep in mind, we'll be doing some calculations with light later on, is that the speed of light, regardless of its wavelength or frequency, so radio waves as well as gamma wave waves, move through space at the same speed. 
in that we call that the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Just some other basic vocabulary terms for light. The amplitude is the height of a wave and that's related to how bright a light is, how intense the light is. The wavelength is the distance between two peaks or likewise the distance between two troughs and wavelength is very important to us. Frequency are the number of cycles there are um, in a certain period of time. So um, if you have a lot of cycles, that would be high frequency. And if you have fewer cycles, that would be a low frequency. The units of frequency are Hertz, which simply stands for cycles per second, or hopefully you know that S, anything to the minus one is just one over that variable. Alrighty, so there's an important relationship between wavelength and frequency. It turns out that the larger the wavelength, okay, the larger the wave or the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. That means the fewer ups and downs you have, okay? And similarly, the shorter the wavelength, see how teeny tiny this wavelength is? The higher the frequency, the more up and downs you'll have. So as one goes up, the other goes down, okay? As one goes up, the other goes down. So that is an inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. Mathematically, we can show it like this. It's often written, C is the speed of light, which we talked about, it's a constant. So the speed of light is wavelength times frequency. So wavelength times frequency is always equal to the speed of light. And of course, you need to be able to rearrange these equations to solve for either frequency or wavelength. Just remember C is always on top. So let's do an example of that. It's a typical problem. In this case, you're given the frequency of a certain type of light and you're asked to calculate the wavelength. Be careful though, in nanometers. Now this equation uh, light must be, the wavelength of the light must be in meters. So it's important to be able to convert between meters um, and other units of length with prefixes like centimeters, nanometers, etc. All right, so we are um, need to solve for wavelength. So wavelength is the speed of light divided by frequency. Speed of light is always 3 times 10 to the 8th. Frequency given in the problem. Um, the seconds cancel out, and so the units for wavelength coming out of this equation will always be meters. Okay, so it turns out that this light is has a wavelength of 6.49 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. The problem asks for the reaction in nanometers, and so we need to set up that equation. Um, as this equivalency tells us, there are one times 10 to the minus nine meters in one nanometer. So doing your dimensional analysis, um, we get that 6.49 times 10 to the minus seven meters is 649, whoops, that should be nanometers. Sorry about that. All right, so I would go ahead and enter this in your calculator and start getting familiar with using scientific notation in your calculator. It's really common um, for students to enter the scientific notation incorrectly. If you use the old method of one times 10 carat minus nine, uh, you'll wanna make sure that your scientific notation numbers typically are in parentheses, otherwise your calculator will misread what you're asking it to do. I think an easier way to enter all scientific notation in your calculator is to use the double E button if you have one. In that case, the double E button actually stands for times 10 to the something up here. So you can leave all that out. So you just put in the coefficient, which is one, 
put in the exponent, or double E, then the exponent minus 9. You don't need parentheses. It's easy. Um, some calculators have exponent button instead of double E button, and some have 10 to the X button. So all of these three should work equivalently. Here's one that I'd like you to try. So I recommend turning off the video, um, making sure you have the equation written down, and see if you can solve this. In this case, it kind of goes backwards. They're giving you the wavelength, and they're asking you to calculate frequency. Now be careful, because the wavelength they gave you is nanometers, and remember, it has to be in meters before you can use that equation. So turn off the video, and then I'll go through the answer. So the first thing I'm going to do is convert nanometers to meters. And I know that there are 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters in 1 nanometer. Now, if you remember in dimensional analysis, you need to match units on the diagonal so they cancel out. Okay, and the unit you want that you're trying to get to goes on top. So now put that into your calculator, 515 times 1 times 10 to the minus 9, and you get that 5.15 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now we can go ahead and use our equation. In this case, we're trying to solve for frequency. And if you rearrange that equation correctly, you get that it's a speed of light over wavelength. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second is the speed of light. The wavelength in meters is 5.15 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Okay, and the meters cancel. All right, so if you put that into your calculator correctly, you're going to find the frequency is 5.83 times 10 to the 14th. Units for frequency are 1 over seconds. That can also be expressed as hertz or simply seconds to the minus 1. Okay, so back to the photoelectric effect and some of the contributions by different scientists toward the quantum mechanical model. You might remember in physics that if you're talking about wave behavior, and remember, we the discovery was that electrons or all types of matter can have wave behavior. It with when you have waves, they can add together to make a larger wave. Um, remember, the ampl amplitude is the intensity or brightness of a wave. So, if you have um, waves that combine constructively, you can get a brighter light. Um, and just a simple destructive, if the waves combine out of alignment, they can actually destroy each other and eliminate the light. So with that in mind, go back to Einstein's photoelectric effect, and this is why he was so surprised. He thought that he could basically take any wavelength of light, and if he shined it on the metal for long enough, an electron would be ejected, because he was thinking that waves combine in a constructive fashion, and that he thought when he reached it, you know, bright enough that an electron would eject, which is not the case, okay? Um, it turns out that it required a very specific frequency and therefore energy of light. So, you know, here's just a graphical visit. So, in order to eject an electron, you had something called a threshold frequency or threshold energy. And that was reflective, or that was an indication of the energy with which the electron is bound to that atom. So he then proposed, Einstein proposed, that the energy um, required um, was equal to the frequency times some constant, which we call Planck's constant. I will always give you the values for constant, but that's the value of uh, Planck's constant. So you can do calculations. So the bottom line is energy and frequency are directly proportional. As one of them goes up, the other one goes up. So let's look at this frequency and then look at a lower frequency. This has a higher frequency and a higher energy. 
The bottom wave has a lower frequency and a lower energy. All right, so now we have two equations so far. We have this one for energy, okay? E equals H nu. And we also have the one from a couple slides ago, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times frequency. If you combine those two equations, you can get kind of a handy combined formula that you may or may not choose to use, but it's the energy is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. And that allows us to directly see the relationship between energy and wavelength, which is inverse. So here's a problem that uses the combined equation. And this, is, this one's a little tricky. Um, so I want you to give it some thought. Um, first of all, hopefully notice that wavelength, or remember, wavelength needs to be in meters. So let's go ahead and convert nanometers to meters. And so if, this is a conversion you'll want to memorize. So there's one nanometer is one times 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, so then we get that that is 3.37 times 10 to the minus seven meters, and that's our wavelength. Alrighty. Um, so the problem here is it would be easy, and I would assume that you would say, okay, they're giving us energy. Maybe I just plug that in here. No, and this the reason I put this problem in here is this is a really important differentiating point that isn't made clear in a lot of text. So the amount of energy that comes out of this equation is the energy for one single photon, one single photon of light. So you've got to read the questions carefully. Most of them will say, what's the energy of one photon? But notice here, it says a nitrogen gas laser pulse. So a pulse or a stream or anything like that is going to contain lots of photons, okay? So you cannot plug this energy term into the equation um, because it's not for one photon. So let's plug in everything else we know. So we're going to solve for energy of one photon. So Planck's constant, H, and I'll always give you the constants. You don't need to memorize those. But here's H, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, whoops, joules times second, times the speed of light which is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That is a squeaky toy, sorry about that. Um, so the seconds cancel out. Then the um, wavelength goes in the bottom in meters. So that's 3.37 times 10 to the minus seven meters. So meters cancel. And we're gonna solve for energy of one photon now. And if you plug all that into your calculator, the energy for one photon of this light is 5.90 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. See, joules is the only thing left here, and that happens to be the units for energy. Um, and you will find most of the time the energy for a photon is on the order of 10 to the minus 19. That's just kind of good to know. So then this question says, um, how many photons does this pulse of light contain? So now you just want how many times does 5.9 times 10 to the minus 19 go into that total energy of that pulse? So that's just simply 3.83 times 10 to the minus 3 joules divided by 5.90 times 10 to the minus 19. And that equals 6.49 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. That's a lot, that many photons. That's a huge number of photons. 
Okie doke. So take some time, make sure you understand that's one of the harder problems. That would be a problem. I always rank the difficulty of problems from one being the easiest to five being the hardest. This may be a five, if not, then very close to a five. I also want you to actually get the calculator you're going to be using on a test and plug these values in. Make sure you get the same value with the right exponent. If you get 5.90, but your exponent is not minus 19, you are using your calculator incorrectly. So make sure that you're putting scientific notation in your calculator correctly. Okay, and here is the solution presented very neatly and nicely, if you prefer that, rather my slappy, sloppy handwriting. All right, so we have talked about Thomson and his discovery of the electron, and then Rutherford and his discovery of the nucleus. And the, the scientists who introduced even the concept of quantum theory or quantum mechanics was Bohr. So Bohr's atom has the nucleus in the middle, and then it, you've probably seen this drawn. I'm such a bad drawer. Okay, it's got kind of rings around it. Well, that's Bohr's model. According to classical physics, that's before quantum mechanics was around, um, since the electrons have a negative charge and protons in the nucleus have a positive charge, classical physics predicts that these electrons will fall or collapse into the nucleus, which obviously doesn't happen. So Bohr's the one that suggested that electrons can only exist in certain energy levels. And we say that, well, according to Bohr's theory, that electrons are quantized. So you should know that vocabulary. We still believe that's true today, that electrons are quantized. So that's a valuable part of his theory. Um, however, Bohr still did think that electrons orbited the nucleus, and we know that they don't. So not all aspects of his model are correct. Bohr's model is still real useful today um, because if we draw his energy rings, it allows us to explain the origin of light. And um, it turns out that every single source of light is a result of electrons in one energy level getting excited to a higher energy level. And then when that excited electron re returns back down to its original lower energy state, the extra energy is released as a photon. And all light is a result of excited electrons relaxing back down. So light from the sun um, is, uh, well, the stars and the sun are made mostly up of hydrogen and helium. So it's the electrons and hydrogen and helium undergoing that process. Um, the light from a, if you look at a fluorescent tube, maybe in your kitchen ceiling, um, it is filled with a little bead of mercury. And so when electricity is applied, uh, the electrons in the mercury atom get excited and when they relax, mercury happens to emit white light. So you should be able to understand or recreate this diagram to explain how light is formed. All right, so the energy levels, um, according to Bohr, um, are showed with these concentric rings and they're ch N, the energy level one. So the energy level closest to the nucleus is the lowest energy. And then it goes up in integers, N equals two, N equals three. So the type of light that is emitted from an excited electron depends on the space between the energy level the electron started on and the energy level it got excited to, okay? So an energy dropping from an excited level of n equals five all the way down to n equals one, that's gonna be, that's a lot of energy. <clears throat> that would be a high energy light and for example, blue. So we know, hopefully you know that blue light has higher energy than red light if you did the Roy Biv thing in high school. And along a similar line of thought, if you have an electron that has been excited only by one energy level, let's say from n equal one to n equal two, 
um, the amount of energy or the energy that the, that light when the electron goes back down to the lower energy level is going to be relatively low energy. That's not much of an energy gap. And so red light is lower energy than blue. So that might be red light, for example. All right, so every single element has its own unique um, line spectra. Um, of the light that it emits, and it all depends on the spacing of the electron energy orbitals. So um, here's the nucleus. So one element may have spacing like that. The next element may have spacing like this. Okay, so they're all going to have different gaps and different wavelengths of light that's emitted when the electrons get excited. You may have done the experiment in high school where you put little samples of compounds in a Bunsen burner and they turn beautiful colors. Um, that's, what, that's what's going on there. All right, so kind of a little bit more technical diagram. Um, hydrogen has been studied in detail just because it's our most simple um, atom. And so here's hydrogen and the energy rings. Okay, so you can have transition from any level to any other level, okay? So you can transition from, if you go from level one, let's say, or what, whatever level an electron's on, and if it goes so far that it leaves the atom, that is called ionization energy, which means it's completely removed from the atom and you've created an ion. But most of the others, so you can have transition from any level to any other level. And the hydrogen atom's been studied extensively. We know exactly what wavelength of light comes from what transition. And you don't have to have any of these memorized. All right, we can calculate the energy of a specific transition if we know what the energy level was to begin with and what it is finally. We can use this equation. It is called the Rydberg equation. And I don't want you to get confused. There are two forms of it. So make a note to yourself. Um, if you're asked in the question to calculate the energy of the light or the photon, released from a transition, you want to use this form. If you are asked to find the wavelength of the light emitted, you want to use this form. Both forms will work because you remember you can go from energy to wavelength. Remember the combined equation where energy is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. So that's all they did here. They took this equation and, and used this to rearrange it. So um, the constant is different depending on the equation you use. If you use energy, it's minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th. If you use the wavelength format, it is 1.097 times 10 to the 7th. So just be careful. It is so, I typically have to work these Rydberg problems three times before I stop making mistakes. Um, because notice N is the energy level that the electron um, is on. So um, F is final. So the, the, final, um, the re final resting place of the electron is NF, and the one it started on is initial. And they have to go in this order, or the sign is going to be wrong. Okay. Then notice you square um, these energy levels. So it's just, it's very, very easy to make silly mistakes. If you use the wavelength form of the, the Rydberg equation, um, whatever energy level is lower goes here. Okay? All righty, so we can pick one out. Here's a typical example. Determine the wavelength of light emitted when an electron makes a transition from n equals 6, okay? So that would be the initial energy level, okay, to n equals 5. That would be the final. 
So the first thing I want you to understand is if I didn't tell you that light was emitted, if I just said, you know, what's the energy of this light? And then I asked you, is light being emitted or is light being absorbed? Would you be able to predict that? So let's see, we're going from six to five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we're going from N equals six to N equals five. Okay, so we're going from a higher energy to a lower energy. So light is emitted. Anytime you go from a higher energy to a lower energy, light's emitted. If it would have said the other way, if it would have said from n equals 5 to n equals 6, light must be absorbed to go to a higher energy level. So just keep that in mind. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in and work this out. And as usual, I recommend that you go ahead and turn off the video now and see how frustratingly tricky this math is and see if you can get the right answer. Alrighty, first thing to notice is the question asked for wavelength. So I'm going to use this form of the Rydberg equation. You could use the energy form of the Rydberg equation, but when you found the energy, you'd then have to convert it to wavelength. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in what I know here. And in this form of the Rydberg equation, N1 has to be the smaller energy level, whatever it is, whether it's initial or final. And so the smaller energy level is 5, so it's 1 over 5 squared minus 1 over 6 squared. All right, so this is where it can get tricky and probably the most common place to make the mistake. So this is basically 1 over 25 minus 1 over 36. Do not round it too much. Go ahead and carry out a lot of digits in these fractions. Um, well, I guess you don't have to in this case. 1 over 25 is exactly 0.04. And 1 divided by 36 is hmm, 0.02778. That one I'm going to carry out. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and do this first before I multiply it. It just simplifies my life. And I'm going to carry all these digits out so I don't um, artificially or, or prematurely truncate the real answer. And what I get for that is 0 0.01222. And then I'm going to multiply that by the Rydberg constant, 1.097 times 10 to the 7th. And let's see what I get. I get that 1 over the wavelength equals 134,078. Now, here comes the second most common error. This is not the wavelength, guys. It's 1 over the wavelength. So you have to remember that to get the actual wavelength, you have to take 1 over this number. You've got to flip it back, all right? And so when we do that, we get that the actual wavelength is 7.46 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, minus six meters. Okay, so that is your answer. Here's one for you to try on your own. And so if you didn't try the other one on your own or if you had trouble, go ahead and give it another shot. So put the video on pause, please. Alrighty, so here's the setup. It's asking for wavelength again, so I'm gonna use that equation. Um, be real careful with the fractional part. It's final, which is n equals 2, and original, n equals 4. Um, carry the extra decimal places here so you get a more precise answer. So then you should get that 1 over the wavelength is 2,056,875. Remember, you need to flip it 
So one over that number is gonna give you wavelength. And so one over that is 4.86 times 10 to the minus seven meters. Make sure you go, can go from meters to nanometers, too. That would be 486 nanometers. That's it for this lecture.